All right, if you haven't read through the poem already, go and take a look in the description and you'll see a copy of the poem there. Uh, have a quick read. So we're analyzing the poem Midterm Break and you'll have noticed that it's quite a depressing poem about death. And we can in fact say that it is autobiographical because Heaney um, actually had a younger brother named Christopher who was killed by a car at age four. And if you go to the bottom of the page, it talks about a four-foot box, a foot for every year. Uh, so the child that was killed was four years old. So it therefore seems fitting that this is a personal reflection of something that really happened in the poet's life. Okay, but let's have a look. I, being a um, first-person pronoun, he's saying that I sat all morning. It was just him, in a sense. Okay, so I sat all morning in the college sick bay, counting bells, nailing classes to a close. So the reason why he sat in college sick bay, so he's in high school, he's in the boarding house, and he's been put in sick bay all day. So in the morning, he got told, probably in the morning, he got told, listen, your brother's been killed. Now he has to sit by himself, okay, in the sick bay throughout the whole day with his thoughts thinking about the fact that his brother has died okay counting the bells nailing classes to a close so in other words let's say his school has seven periods then he's counting each bell okay that's another period down that's another period down that's another period down All right. now a knell uh, if you've read Macbeth uh, as well you'll you'll remember this and knell is a funeral bell okay so that's quite a nice reference to death. So yes, it's, there's not actually a funeral bell. It's just the school bell ringing uh, at the end of the period and stuff. But the fact that the poet has said knelling is fitting because, well, we know that the bell is counting down to the time when he goes home and, well, witnesses death. Okay. It fits with the, the theme of the poem. All right. And knelling, of course, is on a matter pier. Uh, pigs only eat ink apples. That's how I remember it, um, because the word represents a sound. Okay, fine. At two o'clock, our neighbors drove me home. So from the morning sometime till two o'clock when school ended, um, the neighbors of his house came to fetch him and, and took him home. That's a long time to sit and think, eh? Shame. Okay, next stanza. In the porch, I met my father crying. Okay, so now he's arrived home now, okay? And in the porch, the front of the house, he sees his father, and the father is crying. Now, the reason why the father is in the porch was inside the house is, or, you know, is where all the kind of sadness is. That's where the family members are, the friends, etc. And they're all there crying and mourning and whatever. So he's trying to separate himself. You know that if you've been really upset before, um, sometimes you just want to be left alone. Uh, so that's probably why, what he's done. You know, he's gone outside just to try and get away from that sad house. And uh, we're still first person here. The whole poem is first person. I met my father crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride. So it indicates that he, usually the father doesn't get too emotional about it. Um, so the fact that he's crying means that this has had a very bad effect on him. And you can imagine having a four-year-old killed would do that. And Big Jim Evans saying it was a hard blow. Okay, we don't know who Big Jim Evans is. It's probably a family friend, right? But he's there. And that's obviously what they refer to him as. And he is saying, oh, it was a hard blow. Now, I've written there, that's a pun. In fact, that's quite a cruel pun because hard blow, in other words, well, it was a hard blow. The boy was literally hit by the car. Okay. But it's also a hard blow. In other words, shame is very sad. It's a big travesty. Okay. Stanza three. The baby cooed and laughed and rocked the pram. Now, there's a baby in the house or on the porch, okay? We don't know. Uh, I don't know. It says when I came in, so he must be probably near the door there somewhere, okay, inside. Now, as you know, a baby is pretty oblivious to anything that's happening. So, the baby doesn't know, like, that there's somebody has died and that people are sad and whatever. He's just kind of like, or she's just kind of sitting there in a pram or whatever. Um, okay, so she's unaware of it. Fine. Um, when I came in and I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand. Interesting here. I was embarrassed by old men standing up to shake my hand. Okay, so he is a boy, right? Now he has to kind of take the role of an adult because adults shake each other's hands and stuff. When you're a kid, you don't really do that. 
particularly you know with your friends and that so now it's kind of awkward for him to have these old men uh, coming up to him and shaking his hand you know sorry for your loss and stuff it's he's not used to it he doesn't really know how to react okay and tell me they were sorry for my trouble okay so we've got here shake my hand and tell me so we've got enjoyment 100% enjoyment I don't know if I've actually written it here okay enjoyment and tell me they were sorry for my trouble now these single uh, inverted commas here is kind of showing direct speech that is exactly what these old men said to him we're sorry for your trouble essentially okay now uh, that is a euphemism because a euphemism remember is a figure of speech that says something horrid in a nicer way sorry for my trouble now if you have trouble trouble generally is something that will like go away it won't last forever okay but that's actually not true here because it will last forever because it's dead it's not coming back just try and zoom in a bit here that's uh, a bit better all right um, and it's a cliche you know oh, we're sorry for your loss we're sorry for your trouble and stuff it actually provides little comfort because it's meaningless that's the whole point of a cliche it's overworked expression that's lost its power whispers okay so people inside the house are whispering to each other to strangers that oh there is the eldest son okay so strangers who didn't know the, the family very well or whatever um, perhaps won't know that this boy is their eldest son so the whispers say oh, okay he's the eldest right fine away at school as my mother held my hand in hers okay now away at school that is Heaney's way of probably saying this happened while I was away at school you know if you can imagine if something terrible happens to one of your family members and you weren't there you get a sense of guilt then this line strangely kind of runs from one stanza to the next as my mother held my hand oh there we go enjoyment um, in hers and coughed out angry tearless sighs I've said that, that this enjoyment here suggests a long time crying all right mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry tearless sighs I suppose that's uh, yeah, like I suppose that's a bit of personification as it's written here because you have angry sighs although it's also a bit of a transferred epithet isn't it because it's not actually the sighs that are angry it's the mother that's angry so that's a transferred epithet okay um, tearless you know she's still in shock of it all and people react differently when they suffer loss some cry some get really angry physically some shout some go silent and kind of hide away so I don't think the whole tragedy is set in properly yet she's still in shock so she hasn't actually cried tears yet but I'm sure she will um, a little bit later maybe when everyone's gone or in a couple of days time when it really hits home and then at 10 o'clock only the ambulance arrives so that's a, a long time and a long day particularly for the speaker here because he's been sitting in College Bay all since morning thinking about this all right um, ambulance arrived and now the thing is yeah I've said that when an ambulance arrives it's usually a good thing you know like if somebody's having a heart attack or something the ambulance arrives okay great helps on its way but the irony in this case is that the ambulance is actually bringing death arrived with the corpse the word corpse tells us that the body is dead um, the person is dead but it also removes the humanity of it because by referring to it as a corpse you don't see it as your brother or your son anymore okay which helps you perhaps deal with the fact that he's dead staunch to staunch something to stop the blood and bandaged by the nurses obviously uh, the damage that was done um, they tried to kind of make him look a bit more presentable to the family it certainly was a hard blow because stopping the blood and stuff he got hit really hard okay next stanza next morning okay I went up into the room and this is the room this is probably the son's bedroom where the body is snow drops with little flowers and candles soothe the bedside so they've lit candles near him I saw him for the first time in six weeks okay so he actually sees his brother so the day before yeah he didn't look at him but it was late though 
Okay. Um, and I've written here, it's no longer a bedroom, but actually a place of mourning. And you can imagine uh, with these snowdrops and these candles and that, it's, it's a place of mourning. It's not something that you would put in your bedroom usually. I saw him for the first time in six weeks. Again, that's linking to the guilt that we, we saw earlier. Okay. It's been six weeks since he saw him. Paler now, of course, because he's dead. Um, you know, blood's not flowing through his body. Wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. So on the left side of his head, he's got a big bruise from the incident. Okay. But it's referred to as a poppy bruise. Now, there's two meanings there. A poppy is a, a flower, and it's red. Okay, so that links to the fact that the uh, the bruise is like a purpley red color. But also, a poppy is uh, shown as a sign of remembrance. So, at a remembrance day, for example, uh, you will have poppies around um, when you remember those who have fallen. Okay, so that makes sense. And then the word wearing here. If you wear something, like you wear a hat. Usually it means you can take it off, like you can wear a jacket and take it off. Um, so I've put there unreal. It's as if the speaker is saying, surely that this is like not real. Like surely this is just a dream kind of thing. He's trying to distance himself from his brother, from the corpse to try and deal with it. Okay. He lay in the four foot box. Okay, so the son lay in the four foot box. All right, four foot makes sense because he's small he's only four years old and the four there is quite significant because he is four years old all right um, as in his cot a simile so the way he's lying is being compared to how a baby lies in its cot now when a baby is in a cot it's safe you know that's why you have a cot you put the baby in there and it can play around and, and cry and, and sleep and all that kind of stuff safely so here the brother is safe in this box because well he's dead you know um, but it also symbolizes how peaceful the child is no gaudy scars the bumper knocked him clear okay so gaudy means like showy and flashy it's not like savagely ripped open and stuff the bumper knocked him clear so as I said earlier the car hit him hard and so therefore he went flying and death was probably pretty instant which I suppose is a bit of relief if you can say that okay sounds a bit cold and then the last line there all by itself a four foot box a foot for every year so again that tells us that he was four when he died but it also signifies the brevity of the child's life you know he was only four years old and then his whole life was snuffed out that was that done he hadn't had a chance to actually live and that goes the same for all of us, really. But we never know when our last day is. So, you know, it's terribly cliche as it is. You know, always live life to the fullest and stuff. But it actually really is true. You really must. Um, and then the word box there, again, repeated, um, which is a euphemism for coffin, because the speaker is detaching himself from reality. And that is something that many people do to try and deal with a terrible situation. Alright guys, so I hope that has helped you in analyzing the poem.